Hoffman had said that we would see a 5% cut to education last week. Um, wondering when we'll see that cut and public testimony was taken on the budget before um, that cut was included. So will there be an opportunity for the public to weigh in once we see those cuts? Well, you'll have to uh, speak to Senator Hoffman about his schedule for public testimony. Um, we talked about the cut uh, before we had public testimony. I think the whole world knows there's going to be a 5% cut in the Senate budget for those four key areas of spend, if you will, education, Department of Transportation, the University, and HESS. Um, I would expect a 5% cut, and um, you'll, we'll ask the um, co-chair if he plans to do additional public testimony. We heard loud and clear from the public what their beliefs were on that cut. Um, they, we've telegraphed it or all year long, so um, well, I guess the, I'm the about being able to see which specific like programs where the cuts are landing, how can the public weigh in? Right. Um, I will pass that along, and uh, we'll see what we we are uh, pretty heavy on public testimony. We like to hear what people have to say. That's for sure. Um, we took two days of it last week. And now that we have the House budget, we'll do our best to get ours processed the rest of this week and um, get it out for everyone to see. Austin? Austin Baird from KTUU. Uh, on the motor fuels tax increase, do you support that passing? And do you expect it to actually have a uh, consensus to move through the Senate this year? So it's, uh, it's one of the bills that we, I, I don't know if you remember me processing it last year. I was the chair of transportation. I passed it along. Um, I put some triggers on it that would reduce it at when recovery occurs, which we believe is likely to happen at some point. Um, I supported the bill then, moved it along. I uh, will likely support it now. It depends on its final form. I'm never going to give that commitment before I see a bill, but it's, uh, it's something that's important to the governor. It's something that's an actual user fee. The more you uh, use refined fuels, the more you're going to pay. But the fact that we're the lowest in the country and will remain one of the lowest in the country um, after the change, we have a big old hole to fill. I think those dollars should be... Um, I hate to use the word earmarked, that's not popular anymore, but they should be ear earmarked for transportation infrastructure. And I do agree that uh, the air fuel should be spent on airports and the motor fuel for highways should be spent on highways. And I hope that's the way it continues forward. I know we can't have a dedicated fund, but we can certainly know which way to send it in the future. Um, but I believe it likely has the support um, to leave the Senate. I'm not going to speak for others, but in our discussions, it seems like it does. Uh, well, that's hard to say. We're uh, having our first hearing this week, um, but uh, there's 20 days left, so somewhere between now and Easter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and if I could follow up on that, sure. uh, uh, the majority there is correct. Uh, you know, it, would, it, it depends on the final version of the bill. Um, the bill that the House is, is currently working on, where they exempted, I think, the fishing industry. Um, in, in my opinion, it, it would have to, uh, or I guess not exempt, but they give a credit uh, to, to the fishing, uh, commercial fishing. Uh, in, in, in the bill I would support or, or could support, again, uh, would, would have to be a, a clean bill with no, no exemptions. Because once you start carving out exemptions, then it, it's, not, uh, it, it's, not, it's not fair. Right. And I, that just deserves a wrap up. I agree with that. I mean, you're going to see in any of these big policy issues that people try to sidestep the tough decisions by treating an industry in their district. And frankly, we're all in the same boat, so to speak, in that case. I, I didn't mean it that way. But um, when you start exempting, I mean, someday if we have to talk about broad-based taxes, the more exemptions you lay on the table, the less effective the tax. And then suddenly you have, you have favored sons that are not pitching in, if you will. So I, I, we do support a clean bill. And uh, everyone wants to find a way for it not to be as bad in their district. And the reality of it is we've, we've tried to take the um, philosophy that we know these decisions are going to hurt everybody a little bit. But we think if it's uh, spread across our population somewhat evenly, that that's the fairest way to get us out of this fiscal gap. 
Uh, James. I did want to follow up from my question earlier and ask you more directly. Um, as rules chairman, as majority leader, or as committee chairman, are you deliberately slowing the consideration of bills from the House majority? Well, asking it that way, I can um, specifically answer you directly that the answer is no. That um, we have a House majority to work with. It's different than the House majority last year. We know how the system works, and we're not playing games. Good bills that need to be heard, that are important for Alaskans, are going to be heard. They're going to be processed, and if they're good enough, supported by the majority on our side, they're going to be passed. And we're not, we don't have two separate piles, one of the House majority and one of the House minority, and we purposely have slowed down minority bills. We hope those games aren't played um, toward the end of the session here, where they're starting to hold back bills to try to promote policy that we don't think is is uh, the right way to go in Alaska and we certainly don't plan to play that game and, and mr. majority I, I checked before we came up here we only have two house bills in in the rules committee and we just just we just got them obviously you want to pass the Senate bills first just because they have another body to go through um, and uh, as, as far as I there is no more Senate bills in in, in rules we have two on the floor today uh, two fairly substantial bills, even though they're both Senator Machikis, uh, they're, they're, they're good bills. Uh, Liz. Oh, and Andrew's hiding back. Can I go to Andrew first? He hasn't asked a question. Thank you. Yeah. Andrew Kitchen, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, for Senator Coghill, um, do you see, I don't know how much you've worked on SB 96, but if you have looked at it, do you see that as a way to help achieve something like the 5% uh, cut in education, either in the near term or in the long term? So it's being heard today, and there's a, a couple of education bills, but Senate Bill 96 is probably the closest we're going to get to any reform bill. And uh, and it's probably going to have to be part of the process, but I don't know that it becomes part of the 5% at this point because uh, we have to see what comes through both bodies. And so I'd say it's still way into its concept form yet. And so I would not count it at a 5% at this point. But we're trying to figure out tools that we can get to the education community that help them manage, knowing that we're probably in a prolonged low income time in our life, and we're just going to have to do things differently. This helps facilitate that. And so uh, the answer is no, and uh, yes in the long run. So just to follow up on that a little bit, um, and just to, if if it's not clear what the answer is no, but yes in the long run, actually it's going to be the number over. What you're going to see out of our budget is around 200 million um, for a reduction overall. And uh, the policy that you talked about um, is going to be kind of the larger pieces of reform, like you saw with Senate Bill 74 and you saw with Senate Bill 91. Um, we think the larger savings in education is going to be about bringing the cost of health care costs down, and that may, may be a substantial savings to the state as well in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year range if things work out the way we um, hope to see in the future. So um, it's, it's kind of that number you'll ask about when you say, how do you get to that $300 million? You're going to see a couple of hundred million in the budget, and you're going to see uh, these larger um, systemic changes that are going to deliver the other hundred million, if you will. Austin. Oh, I forgot about Liz. Liz. <laughs> Liz Rains with KTVA again. Um, there's a couple of AGDC appointments up in Senate Resources, and I'm wondering, uh, with the news last week that uh, REI is pulling out of the Port McKenzie project because of low LNG prices, is AKLNG, is that project dead for now? Should AGDC be put on ice perhaps to save money? We're in close ties um, and have been communicating often with AGDC. We are struggling with that question as well. Everyone would like to see a, pro a successful project in the future. The question is, is now the time, and how much can the state afford to spend on promoting that project? I mean, there are some deliverables that we would like to see complete, like the um, FERC permitting, um, but you have to ask yourself, how long are we going to stand up AGDC if it doesn't look likely that 
the project is mo moving forward in the near future. Um, don't have a final answer for that, but it, it is certainly a key um, subject of discussion um, this year. We could, I, I promise I'll come that way in just a second. Um, in finance, we've discussed about the 10.5 million operating funding for this year, and um, we are considering uh, more frequent reports. We'd like to have full transparency for Alaskans to understand where AGDC is going. We've seen other major projects that have been interrupted with, uh, from the administration, and if uh, AGDC is expected to continue, then, then we must um, deliver detailed status reports to the people of Alaska. So it doesn't seem like when they're cutting back on things like um, education and um, troopers and the kinds of things that are important to them, should we be promoting a project that um, is not clarifying its intent and what the progress in the future is going to look like. So you'll see additional pressure from us on that. We hope that they'll rise to the occasion. I don't know what the end result will be by the end of this year. Senator? So on the confirmation questions, uh, because the, uh, the governor taking the direction of uh, taking uh, the state lead uh, and because of probably uh, some, myself included, uh, maybe I'll just speak for myself, I'm still not comfortable with the governor's uh, position yet. And so those appointees uh, come under that kind of question in my view. So uh, the credibility of them to be able to take the lead uh, is going to be part of the questions. And uh, 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 there's the economic side of it, and then there's the ability to perform side of it. And uh, I'm not convinced we can get there yet. Uh, Austin, I think it's your. So why, why did a $300 million cut prove unattainable? And will a BSA reduction be a piece of the $200 million reductions we see later this week? So remember, our total plan for three years was $750 million, and um, we still plan on being on goal. At least a target from the Senate side is $300 million. And some of it will be, well, two-thirds of it at least will be in the budget process. Um, other savings will be related to legislation. Um, did an interview with uh, someone in this room just the other day. It's, it's not as easy to find cuts today as it was three years ago. Um, and some of the larger efficiencies are going to be in systemic changes where we decide how many, um, how much administration do we need on the top end? Can we combine departments? Can we trim things dramatically without reducing services on the street level to Alaskans? And I believe there's plenty of room with that. It just takes a little bit more time. So by the end of this session, you may not see a total 300 million in reductions, but you will see it. You'll see work over the interim. You'll see the larger... Um, policy calls that are going to be um, changes on not on doing business differently um, and that's that's going to be probably the hardest challenge take a little bit of time we have the same end goal um, when we get to the end of this process that we need to re-examine what kind of services we're delivering if we can afford to deliver those services and how they can be delivered most efficiently we think there's room there on cutting um, I don't want to say nickel and diming the departments. Um, many of the departments are right-sized. The cut to education is a real one, and we'll see how that ends up with negotiations by the end of the session. Is the BSA right-sized? Um, there will be a cut to the BSA this year, which uh, in my view ends up being somewhat of a shift to the local um, municipalities and school boards, if you will. But with the savings we think we can deliver on health care over the interim and the first of next session, I believe you're going to see that it has uh, less of an impact on them. If we can soften the blow again by hundreds of millions of dollars a year versus um, this cut this year. Okay, I don't see them here for some reason. Uh, Shauna Condo, Alaska Education Update. I, I was just going to ask about uh, what's being discussed right now is is um, the changes to health care for education uh, when you see that happening and, and exactly what that, how that will, will show up? 
Well, I don't want to get out of my league here um, because it's not my area of expertise, but we do know what, what proportion of costs for state employees, um, both PERS and TERS, um, are hitting the state every year. And uh, we do believe that pooling can deliver substantial savings, and um, we intend to promote that forward. That's about kind of all I have on that at the moment. Um, so I don't want to get, again, outside of my my area of expertise. But it is something that's important to the majority, and it's something we plan to forward over the next, uh, certainly over the interim, if we don't get something completed by the end of this session. We can take one more question, and we'll cut it off. If there is one, Nat, did you have your hand up? You're okay. Okay. He Over here. Oh, Andrew. Um, I, I know you said that was about all, all you could say, but pooling, uh, what does that mean? And should be should providers be, should healthcare providers be concerned that they're going to see a significant cut to their incomes? Well, I, I hope that health care providers are at the table. We talked about a provider tax this year. Um, they asked us to hold off so that we can, during the interim, bring all of the entities together, which is how these big pieces of legislation that we've moved, like 74 and 91, um, were successful. So we will be assembling a um, group of experts and the most those that are most concerned about perhaps their margins. Um, on determining how we can deliver health care in this state at a much lower cost to the state. Um, and we believe there are significant savings, significant savings that do not reduce dollars to the classroom, um, that do not reduce key constitutionally required services um, to Alaskans. And uh, it's something we plan to pursue. That's it. Thank you um, again. As I always say, please, if you have any follow-up questions, we're happy to answer them. Go through Daniel. We're uh, available when you need us. And thanks for coming this morning.